The of Charlestown workshop is hereby called to order. Uh, we have several agenda items this evening. The first is 3227 Route 9 sewer line design and construction justification. So we're going to start with uh, Kristen. Um, she's going to stay at the table there. She may invite a couple of other folks up to help her answer questions. Basically, this item is about the uh, Hatchester uh, proposal that um, or, or they showed this, the various options with respect to how to build out the Route 9 sewer project. Um, what we have on the screen is what was put together by the Charlestown Utility Board uh, staff, basically as a way to help simplify maybe the materials that are actually in the packet itself, although you did get the full report. So with that, we'll turn it over to Kristen to get us started. Sure. So what we wanted to do was give a little bit of an overview, take a step back, um, talk through the process of the sewer design. Um, as Daryl mentioned, just give a, <clears throat> a, a little bit of a simplified overview of the Route 9 infrastructure design report that was prepared at the onset of the design and engineering of the, of the project. So, as state, you can go to the, yes. As stated on page two of the, the report, uh, the Route 9 sewer study considered six op options for how best to provide long-term public sewer service for Roxel and other Route 9 corridor properties. The West Virginia Development Office expanded the project from a Roxel and Jefferson Orchards only project to what is now known as the Route 9 infrastructure project. Various options were considered in the, in the onset of the design. Um, those are detailed on page 11 of the May 4th report. Um, the first option was one public pump station located immediately adjacent to the Roxel property. It was designed only for Roxel use. Option two was one public pump station located in Orchard East um, and was designed to, accommodated Roxel, or to accommodate Roxel and other users within the Orchard surrounding properties. Option three was one public pump station located at the Burr Business Park adjacent to War Admiral Boulevard. Option four was one public pump station located at the Locust Knoll development I'll point these out on the next, on the next page. Um, option five was two public pump stations, one located in Orchard East um, as incorporated in option two, and then one located at the Burr Business Park. And then option six incorporated, had three public pump stations, one at, at Orchard East, one at the Burr Business Park, and one at Locust Knoll. So what I've tried to do is, um, give just a brief summary of the, the vetting of these options um, and reasons why the study was basically narrowed down to option three and option five. The first option basically provides no other provisions for any other connections, would likely have septicity issues um, the concern there with septicity is <coughs> that the length of the force main, when it actually hits the connection point, you would uh, realize um, odor, major odor issues um, that could impact all of the downstream sewer lines. Um, the other, I guess, drawback to that option is that there would, there's no provision for any gravity service. Again, you wouldn't be able to connect any other users to that line. Option two had a lot of the similar, uh, similar um, drawbacks with the design. Um, the biggest, I think, would be that there were no provisions for connections at Burr and Bardane, which we, have, we, we know there are capacity issues in that area. Um, then option three, um, I think what, we're, what serves the Western Corridor, decreases septicity, returns capacity to downtown Ranson and Charlestown via rerouting of the sewer um, throughout the, the system. 
Um, I, the drawback would be that it does not provide a public pump station um, at it doesn't gravity to Orchard East and no, no public pump station in that area to, sor to serve the northern region. Option four basically had a, had a pump station at the Locust Knoll property. Again, wouldn't service the northern region, doesn't serve the industrial park, so I think that option was, was ruled out, but it was evaluated. Option five had the two public pump stations. So again, um, it, you know, that option serves the western corridor and the northern corridor. It does decrease the septicity issues. It allows for additional capacity in the downtown and Charlestown um, system, which is aging, and, and we've identified that in various studies that you know, freeing up capacity in this area certainly helps and it provides public pump stations um, consistent with consolidation goals. Um, again, the, the idea would be to provide gravity where we can to eliminate, eliminate numerous pump stations, numerous force mains, um, the sort of spaghetti approach that we've been trying to get away from, obviously, with the consolidation. And then option six was the three pump stations. Um, and it basically, um, you deal with the, it, that had the highest construction cost. Um, didn't necessarily, the, the pump station at no Locust Knoll was um, ruled out as basically there weren't a lot of other developments that, where that pump station made sense. So then on to the next slide. As identified in the report, the Route 9 study con considered the six options. The option that was selected was a variant of option five. Um, it, in it, involved, it entails two public pump stations, one at Burr and one at the Orchard. Um, that option was selected after a thorough review of all of the costs, all of the, you know, comparing all of these options, um, and it was certainly determined that it provided the most flexibility with not a tremendous difference in between options three and five. So the next slide, and I don't know if, if we can, certainly if there are any questions, I can keep going, but um, the next slide basically summarizes why option five was selected. Option five has the two public pump stations and offer, offers a better, what has been defined in the report as a, an EDU per million dollar ratio. Um, so it was, it was uh, better than option one, which only had one pump station. There was a slightly lo uh, longer construction period, but it provides Again, the gravity sewer, which we feel is very important in that northern region to eliminate redundant pump stations, redundant lines, and serves a larger area via gravity. I do have an exhibit. Um, Rick Travers from Hatchchester is here. We can maybe continue going through and then circle back to this particular issue um, after, the, after this. Um, so then option five obviously maximizes the area that can gravity sewer. It allows for the, the difference in EDUs or capacity between option three and five is 553 EDUs. So it equates to roughly 99,000 gallons per day over option three. Um, and again, when you're evaluating the cost and the difference in EDU per million dollar ratio, they were very, very similar. So it, it, it just um, certainly seemed to make sense to get some, some additional capacity in the amount of roughly 99,000 gallons a day. That option stood out and, and was the reason that that was selected. Option five did have an increase in the original loan, loan commitment from the state. Um, so it, it increased from roughly $9 million to $10.5 million. But it align, certainly aligns with the goals of the utility board and the purpose of a consolidation with the consolidation of utilities 
one of the components that was added to this option five, which resulted in the, the increase, was the addition of an air injection system to address any potential septicity issues. Um, and there were some other minor amendments to the original, the original scope, just in alignment. So that was the result of that increase. And then option five obviously provides long-term sewer service to nor the northern region of Jefferson County consistent with our current and prior sewer strategic plans. Additional benefits of the selected option, obviously since the inception of the project, it was to be funded by no risk, no ratepayer impact, state funded bond. Um, option five was selected to offer the best achievable payback, um, including any connections that we could. Um, it certainly makes it easier with consolidation being completed now, um, and those were considered in, in that option. Option five is consistent with the common practices, again, of, of installing as much gravity sewer as we can and servicing areas via gravity where we can eliminate long long-term additional O&M expenses. And the, this option was also consistent with the premise of utility con consolidation. So that's a little, that, that's the summary um, with regard to the selected options. Um, I've got a few other sli slides that address uh, some of the other issues that have that have come up. Um, I was going to walk through those. So I know that the the issue of capacity has has um, been brought up. And what I've included here on the top left is in our permit the uh, permitted average daily flows for Charlestown, Tuscaloosa, and the total. Um, so these are these are required, you know, permitted flows. At Charlestown, we have 1.75 million gallons per day. And then if you look at the chart to the right, I've provided historical information on our total annual flows, average daily flows. You can see the middle column there basically shows from 2010 to 2018, the, the maximum average daily was 1.34 million gallons per day. I've also provided the average peak flow as a reference. Those are included in our strategic plan. And there's a little bit more information from our permit as well. So you can certainly look at that. And then just a couple of bullet point items from our sewer strategic plan. Um, as this was drafted in April of 2018. It addresses the completion of the Ransom extension for Roxel. It talks about the project scope. Um, so that was certainly identified in spring of 2018. And then we have discussed numerous times the, um, the proposed revisions to the, the BSD Flowing Springs project and the last two bullet point items talk about the expansion of our plant, which we are, the Charlestown plant, which we're anticipating in 2033. Um, that is, is fluid, that is consistent with the projections for the Route 9 sewer project, um, but that could, you know, that may be sooner, that may be later, um, but we're evaluating that every year um, and determining how soon we may need to expand the plants. Um, and that's all very highly regulated with our permit as well. And then a few other clarifications. As demonstrated in our 2018 sewer strategic plan and previous capacity discussions, we just went through, there are approx there's approximately 624,900 gallons per day of capacity at the Charlestown and Tuscaloosa plants. 
Planned expansions are anticipated and evaluated frequently. Funding, as demonstrated by the analysis performed by John Kunkel, um, there will be a, a great impacts to Charlestown customers if this opportunity for no risk, no rate payer state funding is not accepted. And the last two items, um, rock wool flows, again, just wanted to make it very clear that what has been demonstrated to DEP, what has been demonstrated to council um, with regard to the flows for rock wool, phase one is 14,900 gallons per day of industrial flows plus the anticipated 5,250 5, gallons per day of domestic flows. The other flows that have been provided to us but are not in stone, not defined as far as the time frame goes, are phase 1B and phase 2. The total of all of their anticipated flows is 46,800 gallons per day. Again, there seems like there's maybe been a little bit of misinformation with regard to that, so I wanted to make that clear. And then the other question um, that came up was with regard to the Jets Farm property. Um, that was a property that was identified on the large exhibit that we had provided previously for the total, depicting the total design flow. And there was um, the, the area that was, the bound, property boundary that was identified on that exhibit was incorrect. Um, it was a, um, an issue with the drafting of this exhibit, so I certainly apologize for that. But the jet does not change the jet farm flows that we have depicted in the projections. Those flows, it was a terminology issue. The pump station along Old Route 9 near the Jets Farm property is what was used um, as an area to determine what flows were coming to that pump station, if that makes sense. So those flows are um, the flows from Burr Industrial and Burr Business Park east of Route 9, plus the flows from school and in, in the upper northern corridor. So we will get that exhibit revised. I apologize, it was just, that was a, an oversight and administrative error there with that, again, terminology issue. All right, I'll, I'll start things off. <laughs> um, all right, so just so I'm, I'm crystal clear. So phase one is included, uh, I'm sorry, page 10. Uh, and the additional clarifications. Mm -hmm. So phase one, the 14.9 plus the 52.50 domestic, that is currently what we're awaiting the, the permit application for, correct? Yes, the, uh, the only thing I would want to clarify is the only thing DEP looks at is the industrial the, flows, right, so, the 14, so they now. are only looking at the 14,900. So phase 1B in the future and all points beyond would require some sort of uh, modification to that permit. That's correct. Okay, and then also, that's just a guess. I mean, I mean, it's in the future, but it'll be addressed. But I mean, right now, it could be three thousand. It could be more. It could be, you know, regardless, that would require a, a, another a full evaluation of their flows, their processes. Yes. Got it. So, um, so that forty six eight hundred in the future could fluctuate. That easily changes. This is right now a, a guesstimate based on the data that they're giving us. Right, I think that they've used very conservative amounts. Again, if they are requesting a design for their facility only, they would want to be on the more conservative side, so I would anticipate, if anything, they would be less than, than that, but it could, could change. All right. I'll yield my remaining time for now. <laughs> Before, maybe the one other thing I guess I'd like to do is follow up with the going back to the discussions about options three and options five. I wanted to touch a little bit on my point about providing gravity sewer where possible 
um, again, consistent with consolidation of utilities. So if you want to pull up those sketches from Hatch Chester, I apologize. It just occurred to me that this might be helpful. So Rick did his, if you could ro rotate them and then go to the second page. Yes. So is the main difference, I know there's a lot of differences, but the main difference between three and five is that pump station? Yes. So and I'm looking at the estimated costs, <coughs> it's almost $2 million difference, right? If this is accurate. This is from the January. Uh, yeah, I, I, I didn't want to get involved in those cost estimates. Obviously, we're <coughs> having to go back now and redo the estimate for option one because so much has changed from January of 2018. Whether or not that difference is consistent from January 2018 until now, I'm not sure. Um, you know, what we evaluated was the ratio of the cost of the project to the EDUs that could be served. And option three and option five were very, very close with that regard. Um, and the additional EDUs that option five provides, the difference is 553. So approximately the 99,000 gallons per day is the difference in capacity between those two options. 
So, that, so option five over option three provides, uh, I'm reading the, the summaries here on the pros, it provides gravity service to Orchards East. It looks like that's really the main difference between option three and option five. Well, it provides, as shown in these, in these exhibits here, it provides gravity sewer to not only or the Orchard property, but it provides gravity uh, to Tackley Mill, to Blackford Village, to the North Branson development, as well as the Jefferson Orchard North. So that may not have been well, described in, in that report, but it certainly provides much more gravity service than just Jefferson Orchard East. Okay, well, I guess I'm, I'm reading the pros in, in the summary here because I'm obviously not an engineer. But I guess, so the question I would have is it seems like the main difference is that one pump station, right? Yes. Okay, so, and again. And well, the, uh, let me, the pump station and um, the provision of gravity for numerous other developments. Can you explain that a little clearer? Sure. So, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you where I'm going. So, you, you know, so you, you're saying without that pump station, then we have to run parallel lines and all this kind of stuff to tie into the Burr pump station, right? It, for yeah, future yeah. growth in Orchard Disease is what you were talking about. So, that's that's kind of where I'm coming from. I just want a clarification on. Besides this one pump station, what else does option five give us that option three does not? Well, it gives you provision for additional gravity um, to service other developments Where? as well as the, the, um, the gravity line. Let me go down to the next one. <coughs> so you can see that I get that, but I'm not seeing how the difference, and again, I apologize, I'm not an engineer, I don't see the difference between these developments down south as opposed to your, your slide before that where you have all those parallel lines. It seems like your explanation was you needed the parallel lines that tie in to the pump station at Burr because you didn't have the pump station up at, the, uh, at Orchards East or at Rock Wolf. Am I reading that correctly? Well, I, 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 I would agree that yes, the large difference in the two options is the pump station that allows for gravity to, for that northern region. Um, the other difference would likely be that the Blackford Village, Tackley Mill, North Ranson developments would not have the ability to gravity to that line, so they would likely have pump stations as well. Why? I mean, you're talking about this area, the yellow below below the Route 9, right? Why would, what, what's the difference? In other words, if you go to your slide, of, and I, I apologize, I'm being dense here. If you go to the slide above this one, all those areas you're talking about are below where the pump station would be, right? Or am I reading that wrong? Yeah, but that doesn't mean that you would change that to. That's, right, that's right. the that's question the, I'm yeah, that's, I'm sorry. That's, yes, that's the big difference is that looking at from the elevation standpoint that we would be, uh, it would be very difficult to sewer those, those properties to gravity with the, with the um, option three design. Without the pump station. Without the pump station. The pump station gives them an extra pump. Right, but the, okay, so the pump, so it acts like an inductor is what you're saying? So the, because the pump station is north of the flow. That's why I'm, I'm just trying to understand. I feel like you may be, I'm not explaining this, um, or if you have a better way to explain I'll, the I'll difference. So this is uh, Rick Travers. Rick and Travers with Hatch. Just 
opposed to putting in a pump that will be slow. So there's no. I think I think I got it. But so there, so there is something in between those two, then, right? Because basically, your assumption in option three was you weren't even going to hit those other developments. But it seems like the main thing is the pump station. Which I'm not against the pump station. Don't get me wrong. I'm just trying to understand the difference. A pump station will allow all the orchards east, the rest of orchards east, to gravity feed into the pump station. And the pump station, if it was built. Like option five without that pump station, I guess. Maybe that's my question. If it's built option five without the pump station, could you take in all those other developments down there? I, yeah, I mean, I think you could. We, it could be, I mean, typically in, in doing that, it end up where there's pump stations that are pumped into the orchard system. You wouldn't have built I guess the only thing that's confusing, the reason I'm asking these questions is as you read the summaries, all it really talks about, the difference between is gravity service to Orchards East. It says it takes care of the Eastern Corridor and all that kind of stuff. But the only thing that it doesn't do between option three and five, and I know this is just a summary, so there is provide that service to Orchards, to, uh, yeah, Orchards East. So I, I think you've answered my question. I appreciate it. I gotta change gears on you just a little bit, unless anybody else wants to jump in. So if, if we go to page seven of your presentation. So <clears throat> trying to understand how this, this Tuscaloosa thing fits into this picture. Our average daily flow capacity for Charleston is 1.75 million gallons per day. For Tuscaloosa is a half a million. Now you had mentioned, I think, right? Now you had mentioned that because of the rain and stuff and the storm waters being funneled into the um, sewer system that you bypassed. How did you, how did you handle that where it went right to, directly to the, the sewage to your plant? So where we were experiencing flows and issues with were at the two lift stations that transfer flows from Tuscaloosa and Locust Hill um, those pump stations go directly to the plant. Um, what we installed was a bypass connection to allow for a larger pump to be connected to the force main lines that go directly to Tuscaloosa to eliminate issues with bypass <coughs> upset spills, those sorts of issues. Um, and so that was certainly our first priority to make sure that we could avoid those situations. So in other words, Tuscaloosa was, was greater than half a million gallons a day? That you were historically, historically, we have always operated roughly around uh, 125,000 gallons a day. Um, last year, you can see that um, at Tuscaloosa, 
Average daily flow was about 210,000 gallons per day. Um, or I'm sorry, that that was a yearly flow. So I don't, I didn't get the the month, the daily. Um, but yeah, we, we were running operating about 125,000 gallons in 2018. We were closer to that 400,000 mark. So it was the plant was okay. Um, the pump stations, you know, we had situations where they were it was tough for them to keep up with that with the groundwater. We we talked to numerous homeowners that had sump pumps running for months at a time into our sewer system. So that was the issue. So more of like an hour or you know, a group of hours. Yes. Uh, yes. Intermittent oh. flows where we had several inches of rain, you know, that normally hits our infrastructure about a day or so later and that's that resulted in the overflows then in the if it's if it's run overflows that I hear about talking about and and then how about the plant itself Did, was there ever here in Charleston was there ever a time where the plant couldn't handle the flows no. based on weather no so no discharges from this plant here no we we did actually have um, an issue uh, recently with a spill on site, but that was not related to any capacity issues or anything like that. How do you uh, calculate average peak flow as opposed to average? I, I assume average daily flow is just the yearly divided by 365, but what's average peak flow? So, yeah, right. It's, yeah, that is a good clarification. It's not defined in the permit, but we do calculate that. So when we submit our monthly flow data to the state, um, we take the maximum flows. We've got aver minimum, average, and max. And so that's calculated off of that maxim maximum flow over a year. So you take the monthly max. I mean, it's right. It's a max day. Right. Okay, so the <clears throat> so basically you take the max day of each month and then divide by twelve. Okay. Uh, <coughs> so then, <coughs> I guess looking at this chart, then for twenty eighteen, our average max day every month we were over our limit by what like. 40,000 or 400,000 gallons a day? 2.13 to 1.75? No, I think, well, I, I, that's not a, that it's not a day every month. It's an average over the year. So whether that, if that peak happened, um, I can further, I can provide those calculations. I just went through the exercise of looking at 2018. Um, but that's not a no. I don't. That's not an accurate. That you're not pulling a, a month at, or a day every month where you were exceeding the max over the year. What your max average peak would be. That Clear as mud. Average, <laughs> average max flow. I guess. I guess what I, what I'm getting to is um, so it shows in 2018 our average daily flow was 1.34 millions. Uh, gallons a day and we're permitted uh, at the Charlestown plant 175 so that leaves us with like 410 thousand gallons a day on average capacity um, how then do we accept so the total design flow for the round 9 project is 908 thousand gallons so more than twice that so how do we accept that capacity well, as we stated in here, we anticipate an expansion in 2033 and those projected flows as defined in the repayment forecast, which are also included in our sewer strategic plan, are over a 30 year period. Um, so to say that 908,000 gallons would come into the line at day one, um, you know, th those, those, that forecast is over an extended period of time at such time that we would hit close to our capacity issues. That's when we would, or well before that would really be when we'd start designing the expansion. Well, looking the at plant. the, looking at the repayment forecast that you gave us, 
it looks like we hit the max users in year 11, which would be 2030. That'd be three years prior to any improvements to the wastewater treatment plant. Um, no, I mean, if, if you look at the repayment forecast, what's ha what's highlighted, hopefully you've got the same one. I'm looking uh, at the earlier one from, from John. Which one are you looking at? I'm looking at the one that we provided to the state, which um, identifies basically the years that the growth is anticipated for any particular project. Yes, yeah. I'd, um. What's your packet page number in? Well, this is from a prior <laughs> meeting. I, I, I carry it all around now. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Uh, which one was this one? This one. So I guess then, I mean, the question still stands. Even if we hit half of that capacity, I guess the question still stands. Even if we hit half of that capacity, 450,000, we're still over our capacity. So how do we, how do we address that? I mean, I don't understand how we reconcile doing upgrades in 2033, but if we hit half of the anticipated capacity, we're still over. And that doesn't include peak times. Well, you know, we have the ability to, I guess getting back to the repayment forecast. So if you, happy to provide this again, um, various projects come online at different times. At 2033, there are really only four projects, five projects, one's halfway built out, that would contribute to those flows. Actually, majority of what we forecast starts in 2031. <coughs> that would likely be the time frame that we would be designing an expansion. Um, it can happen sooner. I mean, if we, our permit requires us to start evaluating design if we reach 90% of our capacity. So that happens five years sooner than we anticipated. We are prepared to do that. I don't know if it can be helpful here, but I was probably the only one who was here the last time we did a major upgrade. I can't remember if you were on for Tuscaloosa. Um, it goes on for years. I mean, you don't wait till 2033 as planned and start it that year and build it that year. Uh, right. Tuscaloosa <laughs> was a four year nightmare, probably something like that. And we're, I mean, it was constantly in front of us in terms of different design phases, cost phases, how we were gonna pay for it. So it isn't, well, I don't know how to describe it's it. Not, yeah, it's not something it's that you process yeah. when you use the 2033 number. That's, <coughs> that's part of our strategic, the, the sewer system strategic plan, but that's not, that's not what drives the upgrade or how the process I think I, I think I might have a, a helpful question. If you give me just a second. All right. When, when, uh, let's just assume that this, this project is completed. What would be the flow be on day one with the existing EDUs that that would be servicing? Not the future, right when we turn that thing on. What would the flows be, ballpark? So as we've projected, we've got the Rockwell phase one flows. Um, we do have a little bit of, now that the consolidation is complete, we have a little bit of design work to make the physical connections to this line once it's built for the Burr flows on the west side of Route 9, Burr flows on the east side, which address the high school, Job core, all of those existing users in that region would connect, um, and we're anticipating about a little, uh, roughly 100,000 gallons per day in addition to the Rockwell flows. Shenandoah Junction has requested service, so those flows roughly 60,000 gallons per day would connect. Okay. So what would the, so you, that's getting pretty close to the 90% mark, right? Well, we have the ability to, again, we've got flexibility between Charlestown and Tuscarilla. Um, so the flows out at Tuscarilla are very, there, there's not a lot more development happening, at, happening out there. So. We've It'll got rain, flexibility. Though. We've got flexibility there, um, and again, we're, we're, we monitor that consistently so that we can anticipate 
when we need to start an expansion project. So your your average daily flow for in 2018 was 1.34 million. Yes. <coughs> average daily flow. So if you're adding another 100,000 or 150,000 to that, right? I mean, 90 percent would be 1.5. 1.58. It's getting pretty close. Well, again, you look at the you've got roughly 300,000 gallons per day at Tuscaloosa additional capacity there. We've got the flexibility to transfer flows if we... If you have capacity there, though. Right. So why is the flow so different between 2018 and 2017 on page 7 of your presentation? Uh, the 70 some odd inches of rain that we had um, contribute a lot, contributed to the increase. Um, I haven't finalized development connections, but it certainly, that, that doesn't address <laughs> the, the differences there, but it, it's the rain and the groundwater table. It, that's kind of concerning though, huh? It's why we are evaluating this year smoke testing, an I and I plan that we'll look specifically at if we have any issues. Typically our I and I has been very low in Charlestown, so. So, I mean, the Charles South plant wouldn't count Tuscaloosa's sump pump issue, issues, or would it? Uh, no. Okay. So, you said 1.58 million gallons per day when this comes online, approximately? Yeah, 1.58 is the 90% uh, of the design capacity. And approximately, where do you think we're at when this first comes online? With rock wool, it would be, if we're just talking about rock wool and some of the initial, that's, we're look yeah, I mean, we're looking at um, 14,000 or 17, yeah, yeah 20,000 20, roughly for rock wool and then whatever existing flows when those come online, approximately 100,000. Mm -hmm. Right, and that's already being treated. Yes, that's a good, very good point. That's already coming to the plant those existing flows. So the only new flow is the rock will phase right, one. Right. So just to clarify an earlier point, I, th I think in our last meeting we kept talking about a hybrid of, of option six. It, it sounds like we're really talking about option five. Do we just want to clarify? Yes, that? yes. I, I, I think that was, um, I, I don't remember whether I had provided that in writing, I, it was my, in my mind we were, it was a version of six, but it was true, yes, the option that's designed is option five, slight variation due to the air injection system and the, some modifications to the alignment. Questions? I do. If we, so, the letter that Rockwell sent and said, hey, listen, whatever happens, we want sewer service, and we have, I think you had mentioned, possibly eight to nine months out to when it would be actually built, and would only have the capacity to carry what their 46 eight or, you would probably build that a little bit bigger than that, I would think, right? Yeah, I mean, there's, there are design factors associated with the design, but. So, what's the difference in time, I don't, and money for that matter, the distance, the difference between doing, I, Besides all the other stuff, I'm just really talking about time and uh, money. The difference between doing that, filling that piece, right, and then doing option five with the state money. The difference is about six to eight months um, on top of the construction schedule. So basically, that rock wall, we'd have to go through the cost estimating, we'd have to um, go through redesign, repermitting. Um, so that puts you in that six to eight month time frame before you'd even have a plan set ready to go to bid. Two months on top of that to have something ready to go out and get realistic cost estimates. So, you know, eight to ten months. So there, we need to respond within 45 days of their letter, right? Yes. What is that response? What has to be included in that response? The only thing we're obligated, we, ha we have to provide them a cost estimate of what 
it will take to get service to their property based on the 46,800 gallons per day. So Pat Shuster's working on that. Um, hope to have that by the end of next week. Is that like a rough order of magnitude estimate or an engineering estimate? It's the reason I'm asking that I mean, it's, it's I don't know if you're directing that to me or directing I was kind of looking at you. <laughs> I know. I, she's right there, though. So uh, it is not a detailed estimate because we don't have detailed plans, but we will pull up farther along and so it's somewhere between that planning phase and that Additional questions for Kristen? I do, but I, I think I have it's probably geared more toward Hawaii. John. I guess if John or Hawaii would like to come up and I'll just come up. Thank you for reorganizing the one spreadsheet and making it. <coughs> I, I wanted to commend you on that. I, I do think it uh, is a clear presentation. Yeah, it, I think for future, <coughs> and it's not mine. Um, I was given it by someone who does government projects. So it, it, I think it's a much better sheet. Um, I think I'll get back to the. Um, there are the two options, and, and one is using a 61% a O&M, and then the other uses a 7.32 number, but I had a question, is that your leak adjustment? But get back to that, if you don't mind. Yes, I, I, I prepared two analyses uh, comparing the, the revenue bond alternative to uh, the extension under 5.5 and I had the impression that um, a, a, a question that the council may have is what what actually happens uh, to these uh, two analyses if the uh, O&M percentage changes and uh, that that was simply my reason for putting in the analysis with the leak adjustment at 7.32 percent um, you you can see that uh, it uh, sheds uh, rule 55 in a more positive light uh, so I, th I thought maybe that would answer that general question for you. I do not endorse that at all. I, I just wanted to illustrate what a, a decline in the O&M rate would, would do to the comparison between the bond issue alternative and Rule 5.5. Is, is the 7.32 is that that, that is O and M or that, that is that is a leak the adjustment? leak adjustment? Okay, so you use the O and M of sixty one percent, and then a leak adjustment of seven point three two. Those were the two uh, um, analyses that I did, and I, again, the seven point three two was solely to illustrate what a decline in the O and M cost would would do to the comparison. I, again, I don't think it's realistic, uh, but I, I did want to try and answer that general question. I thought that was a question 
that I picked up that the council had. Okay. So um, I, I, I thought the, the 61% O&M was also a little for brand new pump stations. But uh, um, let, let me address that. Um, there, at least in uh, prior discussions and uh, also in, in looking at uh, uh, some of the footnotes in, in the new analyses, uh, we, we talk about incremental costs, marginal costs, uh, which is all well and good if you're making short-term financial decisions. These analyses run over a 25-year period. Um, considering a 25-year period, all O&M becomes a variable or incremental cost. And uh, I, I don't think that it would be prudent to uh, compare the two alternatives with uh, simply some marginal cost factor that, that might be applicable for a couple of years. Um, marginal cost, a lot, of, a lot of retailers use it to determine what they, they can, can sell slow moving inventory for very focused specific issues, um, but over the longer term, uh, I, I think you have to, to look at the full cost of service. Well, and so we're, we're, it could float anywhere from 61 down, basically, if you, you put in, according to the way you, in which you adjust the numbers. Yes, the, the, the 61 percent uh, uh, to uh, perhaps refresh your memory, the, the 61 percent own in factor comes from a uh, consolidated uh, cash flow, uh, including ransom, the PSB, and the utility board. Um, that 61 percent. Um, will float, but in my experience, uh, if it's looked at over a number of years, the, the float is two or three percent, maybe. Um, it, it's never, it never drastically changes, even considering growth to the system or uh, perhaps a uh, usage declining even. Okay. Well, if anything changes, if you could before March 4th and if you get any other numbers that you'd like to plug in, I, I'd appreciate seeing them if, if there's a oh. good spreadsheet. Sure. It, it, is there something in particular though that you, you'd want to see? I, I got this. I did not spend <coughs> a lot of time looking at it and I'll get you back more comments, but I, I kind of, kind of want to go to to Hoy and the law, okay. utility law, of a subject I have no, no full knowledge of. So, um, but adding all of this up um, and all of the documents, some say sixteen thousand linear feet, but then you have nine thousand linear feet of. One, so you either have 25 or 29,000 linear feet, basically a little under four miles or five miles of, of pipe. I think it's closer to five miles in the total. Yeah, so, okay. Um, now, I was Googling as I always do, did, and I came up with an article by a Mr. David Dove. Um, who probably wrote the most concise explanation of, um, he wrote it in the, the West Virginia Public Service Commission's uh, newsletter, the pipeline, explaining uh, the 
different ways in which you build a sewer pipeline or the different options of sewer pipelines in West Virginia. Um, so, and his first thing that he said, and he, then he reiterated in the end of his, his thing, was that there is no such thing as a long uh, service line for sewer extensions. And I made copies for everybody, but that's basically the first thing he said, that there's no such thing as a long service line. So then my question is, and I'm, I'm trying to keep these ones for yes and no, uh, is the Rockwell line, which seems to be now called the Rockwell only sewer line, um, is it a dedicated five mile long sewer extension? No, it's a sewer main. It would be a sewer main. I mean, that's what Rule 5.5 5 5. talks about, you know, main line extension. Uh -huh. uh, uh, and that, so that's fine. That's fine. Yeah. That, that is it because the, the, the thing out there is that it is a rock wool only uh, line. And, and so. I'm sorry, just I'm not sure where you, what are you referring to? Oh, the project as designed. Oh, I'm I'm, the I'm talking about <coughs> the part of the five five where you would finance it using the the company would finance it as opposed to the state financing. And so, in the the media and many things I've heard lately, I keep refer hearing it referred to as a rock wool only sewer line, and I just wanted to establish that. You're not building a five miles. If if Rockwell were to execute the option and pay for this themselves, or at the same time, or if the state financed it, it would not be a just for one purpose. It would be for one user. Well, I, I, just to clarify, I mean, certainly the design as it is right now has numerous sections of gravity, horse main, multiple horse mains. Um, <coughs> five, five requests that Rockwell submitted, obviously that we're doing cost estimates for, would be a single horse main for their use only from their site to the existing connection at Chicana Town Center. that would not be accessible by truly anybody else easily. I mean, to connect multiple force mains into the force main that they would construct, it would be a dedicated line from their site to the connection of five miles long. Okay, so that gets me into Mr. Dove's next question, which he lays out, he said there, are basically there are only four ways in West Virginia to extend sewer a mainline extension, an alternative mainline extension, then through normal course of business, and then through a certificate of convenience and necessity. So um, if we're only using a mainline, um, he explains that a, a mainline is a quote where the customer pays the utility upfront the estimated cost of the extension and gets reimbursed for every customer that connects to the extension over the next 10 years, unquote. So he wrote that if all the rules of PSC section 5.5 or, or extensions of Maine are followed, then the Public Service Commission approval is not required for Maine extensions. That's, that's correct. If you, okay. if you do it as it's outlined in the rule, you're you're required to have an agreement, but the agreement does not need to be submitted to the PSC for approval. That's correct. Okay. <coughs> um, so then the, excuse me, I just lost my, uh, if he, this council then selected the so-called state funded sewer line, 10.5, it would be a main line extension correct it's it's a mainline extension done under uh, but it's not done under the you know the 5.5 rules you keep in mind that one thing that's I don't know when uh, David wrote that article mm -hmm. 
and 14. The following year, 2015, is when Senate Bill 234 came along, which nobody was thinking of, I can tell you, the year before. And that's when it, you all got partially deregulated. Mm -hmm. Ordinarily, a project of this size, let's say that um, there was no Senate Bill 234, but you still had the same funding package before you, okay? And you wanted to build a project of the size and magnitude that, as you know, we're, we're talking about. You would have, you being Charlestown, would have had to have filed an application for a certificate of convenience and necessity. You got the specialized financing, but you still got a huge project out there. Uh, uh, that's the way it was done. But now that you're deregulated, you're not required to file for a certificate. You, you have to go through the ordinance process to uh, approve, you know, a project, which you all adopted that. I think we adopted it the last May because it, it was part of the leading up to the acquisition of Roxham. Of course, there's, you know, uh, we now have before the building commission the, the lease, and you all got an ordinance for lease. And that Those are the issues you're dealing with now. But I, but I, my question is, though, if, if Mr. Dove is correct, and there are four ways, there are only four ways to put in a sewer line. But, but he is no longer correct well, with regard to the, the partially deregulated correct. utility. Correct. Um, but in terms of there are only four ways to put in a sewer line. There's a main line extension. There's an alternate main line extension. There's a, the normal course of business, and there's a certificate of convenience and necessity. Whoever approves it, if again, if if this council accepted the state-funded sewer line, the ten point five million dollars, it would be a main line extension, correct? No, it, it's not. As I said, it you would. are deregulated, and it it does not fall into any of those four categories. There are no, there are now for the larger water and sewer utilities five categories. But you've added a fifth category right. for everybody else, for Shepherdstown, for Harpers Ferry, Berkeley Springs. There, none of them are the, in the large category size. So there, yes, they, they, Mr. Dove's uh, 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 four, four methods is correct for them. So would you call the fifth method then a project ordinance? Is the project ordinance? Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah. So, but. The concept, though, of a, it, it would follow the same concept of a mainline extension where um, the customer pays the utility up front and the estimated cost of the extension gets reimbursed for every customer that connects to the extension over the next 10 years. You're still using the concept of a mainline extension. What's it again? I was you're, you're still using for if the state came in and gave us and we did the, the ordinance, the, the... No, no, I mean, I think would, that we've demonstrated the payback yeah. um, for the project. If what, what we're talking about with the state funding is repayment from new customers, that's all detailed in the lease agreement, um, the repayment terms, the repayment term will likely be the 25 years. I think that's been, um, you know, I've certainly heard from the state, so it's, it, it's entirely different from the mainline extension agreement. It has different terms, different length, okay, but, different but repayment strategies. We could take out then the years. Basically, we build a main, one pipe, for, or we build something from one end to another, and new customers then join that and then pay and from that, the uh, whether the state or what, excuse me, Rockwell, they would be reimbursed for a period of time. Yes, twenty-five okay. years. Okay, so if the state does that, the state will be reimbursed. If Rockwell were to build that, again, it's the same theory. Rockwell is reimbursed. The biggest. That's correct. The biggest difference is the O and M expenses are different under that scenario. Likely, um, 
and, and that's, where, that's where I'm kind of going with this. And the other big difference is, though, uh, we know what the project financing wants to do. It wants to build, you know, that's assuming you're going to build the, the full-fledged project or something off of close shore. The Roxville extension under a main extension, 5.5, is to serve Roxville only. The missing component in that scenario is you don't have any infrastructure out there to add the other customers to it. You're going to have to build it sometime. You, you, you may not have to build it in, you know, right now, but you're going to have to build it sometime and finance it more than likely with the traditional revenue bond. May I interject something? <coughs> so <coughs> when they sent us the letter that said they want the Roxel only line, just as you said, I think what uh, Mike is alluding to is if it's a Roxel only line, that doesn't really benefit Roxel because we can't tie new customers to it easily, right? Right. So they. So I guess my question is, have we talked to them on this 5.5 issue to, to do maybe the alt, go along the alternate mainline extension and say, yeah, yeah. yeah, that's a possibility. You've always got a possibility of an alternate lane. Uh, that would be in their best interest, it, correct? Well, it might be. It might be. Seems like it would well, be. Well, it might be and it might not. I mean, if, if it costs more. It would have to be completely re-engineered, too, correct? Yeah. Completely re-engineered. The time frame may be drastically different with the. Yeah. And in the, in the 5.5 analysis, also, uh, uh, the comparison with the bond issue, uh, it, one significant assumption is that under 5.5, we're going to still build the infrastructure exactly. to serve everybody. Same way that we're going to do and, it with the, with the and, state. And Rockwell, in all likelihood, well, would well, not do that. Rockwell Tools is getting upset. We keep <laughs> saying that. <laughs> so under under 5.5 right now, uh, the the Charlestown Utility Board's share of that project is a half a million dollars. But in reality, it could be millions of dollars. So for I, the same infrastructure. Right, now I get that. So. So I guess, thank you for bringing up the, the whole time thing, and I apologize for jumping in here just a second. So, so we have some options now on the table. We've always had all these options. And I, get, I guess what I want to know is, if the plant is, is planning on opening, I don't know, October, that's what I've heard, or something like that, is any of these options that we're talking about, does it realistically put sewer to that facility by the time they open? Don't believe it. Okay, so what happens then? I don't know what they'll do. I'm assuming what they would do would do some type of a pump and haul. So a pump. What is that, Hoy? Can you go, what is that uh, I, for us? I, I think the way it works, there are engineers in here, <laughs> electricians. And you put a tank out there and, and you, you, you discharge your sewage into it and then it's pumped into a, you know, a tank. Everybody, those of you on septic systems, every once in a while you get your septic system pumped. It's the same theory. It would be a little bit larger on, on this one. And you take it to a treatment plant and it's treated, you know, it's just treated there just like any other sewage is treated. So would they take it to our treatment plant where we would consume it? Well, you yeah. take, yeah. they or could, or they could take it, I mean, theoretically, they could take it to some other treatment plant. Okay. So... Let's say the the bond pat. Let's say we do the state funding according to our vote schedule. When is the soonest that they would get sewer service via the line? So the construction schedule is anticipated to be eight months. I would think if we had clear direction within the next couple of weeks, um, that our next steps would be to finalize everything with the state, we'd have to go the supplemental resolution, get that completed, um, and then get the project out to bid. I, so I'm, a, yeah, I'm assuming a minimum of two, once the lender gave you the authority to go to bid mm -hmm. and get ready to have a closing, you are a minimum of two months, and you might be as much as three months. Uh, uh, you know, you got to advertise for the bid, but you've also got some work to do with it with regard to approval of the uh, of the uh, ordinances and the drafting of the documents and all that type of stuff. So you you might be as long as three months away for a project this size, 
I don't know how long of an advertising schedule right. you would have to give contractors to come in and yeah, bid I'm not, on. I don't mean specific, I'm just ballpark. But roughly three, I'm going to say three months, and then once you start construction, Christian and the engineers have said about a nine-month construction period. So a year. So it's roughly a year, and you got to take into account the, the weather. In other words, it, you don't want your construction period to start in the middle of the winter because that might add a couple months to it. Okay, so. so. Like that. With if let's say that we said, hey, listen, we'll, we want to go back. We want to kind of look at this option three again and, and see if we can come down and pick up all these gravity things. How much more time would that add to getting them surveyed? I'm kind of looking at you too because you're the engineer. I, 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 don't. I mean, you know, I, that's that involves going back through the design process, the permitting process. So uh, five months added to that schedule. So, the same height. In a, in a, a proper, yeah, I mean, it could, yeah. So the bond is one year, right, a approximately, to get sewer. If we, if we yeah. re-engineer it, because we already have the plans, it's just a matter of tweaking it. You're saying that's another five to six months added to that? I would say six to eight. Uh, it's got to go through the permit. Yeah, it's a permitting process. Okay, you said eight. I hadn't thought of the permitting, but you can't do the permitting until you got the plans done. Right, so you, you look at the permits that you currently have for them, you start October with that, and then you're in October, and you're still going to add it. But we're talking so about... Right. You're talking about He's saying that gives you some idea. I mean, not to mention, I think that, you know, before we get too far down that road, um, I think the discussion, you know, again... As I'm we, just asking questions. Yeah, no, true. But, um, you know, talking about going back to an option that really the development off the state development office and IJDC who are offering this funding did not, you know, that wasn't the direction they wanted to go. So, so I think we need to clarify with so them. So they approve this? I mean, so they, they had the input into the plans that we adopted? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, the development office was, you know, talked about the pump station wanting, I mean, they're providing this funding at no impact to the ratepayers, and they wanted to maximize okay. the properties that could connect. So okay. I'm just saying that, you know, it may be worthwhile before no, we're I'm talking about going right. back to a different I'm, option. And I'm not saying that, I'm just asking some yeah. questions. <laughs> so if, <laughs> so if, if we go to the, the last piece where it's a Rockville only, which to me is, it's not even an option. It's, it's, because it's you would have, to, it's a terrible option. But, to but be I mean, honest about you would it. have to sit down yeah. and talk to them anyway because it just doesn't make sense. So we'll say some kind of a combination of the five five, what maybe what you're working on, uh, as far as the engineering for the Rockville only. What is the time frame for that? What I'm trying to get is a time frame for all these different things. A time I think frame. That's, yeah, you're in the same situation. I would think with regard to the Rockville only option is you know that six to eight months of going back through design. Um, going back through the permitting, it may be a little bit longer with that option because there's a lot more involved. Yeah, you're starting from scratch. But with what, that. Wouldn't, but we, wouldn't we also want to just, since they wrote us a letter, wouldn't we want to sit down with them and say, well, here's, here's what we've Oh, done. sure. I understand that. But I mean, to spend the money to do a, a, a rocks and line without talking main, to them. Doing an audit of Maine really is up to the developer. Absolutely. Uh, and the I mean, I could I could see something in theory that would say, "Fine, we might we we might agree to do that, but we want to be repaid over 20 years and not 10. We want to get revenue for a longer period of time to recapture more of our investment." Right. And so, uh, you, you don't know that. Right? And we, we don't know what we don't know. I guess. Yeah, again, I'm not saying that that would be a viable option. What right. I'm saying yeah. is for for them. Rather than jumping through the hoops on a rock will only, rocks will only right. I already said rock. And it might get, it, yeah, it could be. But would it be, would it make more sense, or I won't say make more sense, but would it make sense to go to rocks about this letter and say, hey, here's, here's the option that we propose? But or are we bound by law to do what No, I, I, th you, I think you got to give them, they've asked for the 5.5, so you have to give it to them. Uh, that may, you know, maybe it would trigger it. Some, some other discussion, I don't know, but, but you are obligated to do it. There are some cases where utilities have not done it, 
and the PSCs come down and said, no, you got to okay. you got to do it. Got to give it to them. But but I'd like to kind of go back to that. You had a drawing up there earlier where you had three, four lines, literally. And the concept was if other, if, if the, the, the pipeline was built too small effectively, or it was just a Rockwell only pipeline, then you would, future development would in effect have to be running these pipelines over to Burr. Is not the entire purpose behind this whole concept is to do the planning with the developer first, then build in capacity into the pipeline system. And then when other customers come on, then take that, in order, in, instead of putting in a new pipeline, to take that customer's load and then take whatever payment that that new customer comes and then effectively reimburse the developer. I mean, you've got pipelines all over the place going to there. Don't, in any of these processes, you sit down with the company and say, let's build capacity into the system. Well, and I think certainly that was what was done with this project. The initial direction was to provide service to the Rockwell facility. And what we looked at was expanding that to the project as it is designed today that accommodates growth that we anticipate in that northern region. And, but that's um, what I'm getting to is that it's not, it's not just that you're going to be, if, if Rockwell were to say we're going to finance this pipe ourselves, are you going to put in a pipe that just accommodates just phase one, phase two of Rockwell and effectively run that for five miles? Or do you sit down with the company and say, is there opportunity to build in capacity and then if new customers come onto that line, then you will be reimbursed the price or the cost that part of the cost that you paid for that well, pipeline. I think that's what we're talking about. You know, if, if we're not talking about the state funding option, we're in the process of evaluating the Rockwell only 55255 five, five request. Um, once we have that cost estimate, then yes, the next, if we're not dealing with the state funding and the project as designed, it's going to be talk, sitting down to talk to them about what options we have. But, but we don't know. I mean, that's, that's we're, we're not yeah. we're, to, to, to address your uh, uh, scenario. What, in, in my experience, for whatever it's worth, what I've seen is that uh, Roxel <coughs> would, would would pay for their portion of the line. Uh, any additional capacity, uh, the utility board would have to go for traditional financing or something to provide for that. I, I, I think it's rather remote that, that a developer would agree to fund the increased capacity. And, and that's why Mr. Dove says the utility should be aware that the number of signed user agreements for service is a good indicator of the real need for, for a project. I mean. You, you have a lot of capacity built into the system. Chester, you'll catch Chester, they wrote this thing. Yeah. But there are, there are very few EDUs attached and, and you have very few user agreements. Yeah. But let me, let me get to something that, that, that here's the main. One, that's the one thing you, unique about the uh, revenue bond alternative in that you, you have an opportunity here to uh, fund to get funding for growth infrastructure. I, Whereas with traditional projects, particularly going through the, if it was going through the Public Service Commission, uh, they limit you to only serving active customers. They, they do and, not and want that's, you to And that's what I want to get to, that because there are 
some people that have been that have talked about this whole process is dire and that if there's not enough if, if we don't get the state funding then there's just going to be a very small pipeline that runs for the five miles but uh, here's uh, one let, no, me, but let me let respond me, before you go on okay. for, if i might and i remember t we talked about this last fall i, I think it was a congress or a council woman uh, Vanessa that raised the question <coughs> there's, langu there's language in 5.5 that says it has to be economically and technically feasible to the utility I'm paraphrasing in order to, for them to have to, be, to go forward with 5.5 if you're offered the state financing and you choose not to use it and then you want to say to the Public Service Commission or to Roxville, we don't have to give you a 5.5 extension because it's not economically feasible because we have this negative cash flow. You're the one that caused the negative cash flow. You're, I don't believe that defense is going to work at the Public Service Commission. No, but but, this, I, but because, you're, because you've got the financing. We don't have the financing. Want. That's the point, point, no, boy. No, no, Quiet. Yeah, you do. When I'm speaking, you, you got it? You do. We do not have the financing because our building commission has not agreed to sign on. That's true. You don't. We don't have it. But if the building commission votes not to do it, if it does, that's the same thing. Then, then I don't believe that you can then say that you don't have to do a 5.5. I don't believe it's going to work that way. I, I just don't. Okay. I, I, I understand the constriction. Look, we're dealing, we're dealing with the sewer extension rule that's never been designed to do anything like this. I don't know anything close to something like this in you know, the size of the project. Uh, uh, so. But I, I, I mean, I, I, I do. I understand all of that. And that then leads me to the last part of what Mr. Dove said. Um, and it dovetails in, and Mayor, I think you need to tone it down. But um, I had sent word, I don't know if you'd gotten it, that I wanted to ask you about a PSC case that talked about an alternative mainline extension agreement. And this was one the ran that Ransom filed last year in January 25th of last year. It was 180062. Um, and the case appear appears that Ransom attempted to set up the paperwork and put in a placeholder for $9 million in state funding as it was expecting it. it, it put in a, yeah. an, an alternative main line, you know, you know this case, to um, the PSC, knowing that um, we were in negotiations to take over the ransom system, the PSC closed the case and said, y'all need to talk to ransom um, about doing this alternative main line extension, okay. Here's where I'm going with the, all of this. Um, in the, the staff's comments where they closed out this case, it said the proposed sewer extension will be funded by a non-interest bearing loan of up to $9 million for a term of 20 years with payments beginning upon completion of the project pursuant to the main sewer main extension and financing agreement filed in this case. I think it's the, the, it's the last page, second paragraph of the last page of the order. Are you reading the order? I'm reading the order. Well, I'm reading the, excuse me, I'm not reading the order. I'm reading the yeah. final staff report. Oh, you're reading the memo. Yeah. <coughs> Four page, last page, second paragraph. Pursuant to the main extension financing agreement filed in this case, funds for the repayment of the bonds is both derived from and limited to the actual net revenue as defined in the agreement generated by a provision of sewer service to the industrial facilities located on Jefferson Orchard site and certain other new users which may be connected to the sewer facilities to be built under said agreement. See that? Yes. Okay. Now, 
it then says, and goes, going on to quote, we note that this repayment agreement arrangement is somewhat unusual in that the city is not dedicating the entire revenue <coughs> stream from all sewer operations to the repayment of the debt incurred in this case. Um, of course, it's an alternative mainline extension, which they, they basically turned a alternative mainline extension into a mainline extension. Um, but it, it says they are committing the next, or com committing the net revenues generated by users of the new system. Staff opines that this arrangement is beneficial in that it essentially removes risk to the city's existing customers. Question. Why didn't we use this? Now, th this is this is what we're, this is what the uh, 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 what is being proposed. This is the this financing is, yeah, that gets being that proposed. Is, is, it's included in the lease agreement. Uh, the same rules. Language, apply. yeah, with net revenue and stuff. To yeah, the new users, huh? um, not existing users or existing customers. And so we get back to the the sixty one percent. Yes. Yes. It's a, it's the same it's the same concept. Uh, uh, if if they're congratulating us for or if they're congratulating Ransom effectively for essentially removing the risk to their city's existing customers, then how do we in in either of these scenarios that you've given us show that there's going to be existing risk or a risk to the existing customers? We don't believe there is if you take the state financing. There's gotcha. Okay, that's where we're going with there, this. There's no downside risk involved with it. If, if uh, uh, under the, the revenue bond alternative, if uh, there's not a single user connected to the system, then the state's so no out of luck. To the ratepayers. There's no risk to the ratepayers. The, I, th I think that was one of the reasons to. to separate this particular bond issue from the other revenue bonds that the utility board has is to protect the, the current users of the system that only new users would be responsible for repayment and and you've seen that financing arrangement from the state no I, I, I've has. done a lot of these transactions out I haven't done as many John Stump's done more his his firm's done represents utilities in generally doing it, but I'm not aware of any. I should say that the gentleman that wrote this memo, his name is Jonathan Fowler. Some of you may have met him. He, he's testified up here in cases. I think he's the senior engineer at the PSC in water and sewer. He is also the PSC's representative on the IJDC board. This comprise you know, they have different members of different bodies. So he not only was seeing this from the information filed by Ransom in this case at the PSC, he knew what the financing arrangement was because he sits on the board that approves the financing. So he had a little more insight than a, an ordinary staff person would have just because of it. And, and he <coughs> considers the West Virginia uh, Water Development Authority to be the developer, correct? Not What's Rockwell. that? He considers the West Virginia Development office to be the developer, not Rockwell, correct? Mm, I'm not sure where. In that same staff memorandum, and all uh, in, in the entirety of the case, they're always referred to as the developer. Well, it, it, yes, I, yes, I see what you're saying there. <coughs> if if, you, if we were proceeding under 5.5, Rockwell is the developer. This, this, as we said uh, earlier, when uh, Councilman Tolbert was talking about Dave Dove's. Uh, for, for uh, ways to build. We've created this fifth way and, and, uh, and you know, it's an arrangement between the lender and Charlestown. <coughs> Look at it another way. But the lender in this scenario is the developer. Well, no, I think that, well, they're the risk taker. I'll put it that way. They are the ones taking the downside risk. I, I guess my question is, why are you opposed to calling them the developer? 
It's but right there in the PSC order. I don't order. think they are. I think they're a lender. They're not the developer. Well, even in, in other words, they're not going to end up. We're not extending a. Uh, They don't own the property to which the extension is going or any other property out there as far as I know. No, but even in the application <coughs> to them, it says that the IJCT and IJDC intends to construct a 1,000 square foot <laughs> industrial park, not Roxel. They're the developer. Okay. But I, as I said, I consider them the lender. I don't know that it really makes any difference, does it? I think so. I mean, I, I certainly think so. And it impacts the agreements that are in place. And like I said, it's certainly when we're we were just discussing a minute ago about how we would approach an alternate mainline inspection agreement and how we would negotiate that. We would negotiate that with the developer, with the West Virginia development. Right, and yeah, I mean, I think we're talking well, well, about, and, and, yeah. and these terms are different for the application that Ransom made to the commission. What we should focus on is the terminology in our lease agreement with the um, West Virginia Water Development Authority and IJDC, that is what is applicable. You know, these documents are other than, you know, they're public record, but some of this has changed because we've acquired the city of Ransom sewer system and the project. I understand that. I'm, I'm just simply saying if we needed to negotiate with a developer for this project, the developer would that not changes, be rock right. Yeah, if, if we're talking about an alternate mainline extension agreement or even the 5-5 extension agreement, yes, that's a totally different scenario. Right, if you, if, if you wanted to change the scope of the project, yes, you're right. Would, would, they, would, the, would they give you the same financing for a different scope of project? Yes, that, you're right. That's, that's where those discussions would be. And they've, they've changed it several times. I mean, Ranson started out with asking for nine, and they've approved that. And then I think there was another approval of nine. Although I think at the time, and uh, I think the, uh, at the time this case was filed, which I think was in January of uh, 2018 by, by Ransom, I don't know that there was a, I don't know that you had the detailed plans done at that time, and I'm not sure that you know. Correct. You, didn't, didn't, you don't. You didn't have design. the hard number, the harder numbers that you have now. Yeah. Okay. And, and that's what I, you know. That's what I want to get to. Mr. Dove said there were four different ways, yeah. and I know you're. There, there are you, five now. Fifth way. <laughs> uh, real, real quick. Um, the whole tanker thing. What, what was the phrase again? Pump and haul. Pump, pump and haul. haul, okay. That raised a couple of yellow flags for me because that does not sound like fun in the least. Yeah. And yeah. just doing a quick Google search, capacity on a tanker is about 9,000 per. So that's two tankers a day based on, and correct, I mean, is that? Yeah, you're right. And look, we don't have any control we don't know what they'll do they may correct well but it could be i mean just based on their permit that's an issue for them 14.9 plus their domestic that that's that's two tankers a day in addition to whatever traffic is coming in and out of that place already i don't know that scares the heck out of me uh, <laughs> I'm, I, I'm well, sorry. If, if two scares you a hundred should no, i'm just saying you. in addition to in, a, in addition to 102 you know. ain't much different than 100. I, and I get what you're saying, but did we not it. routinely do this when we first bought the um, Willow Springs? Willow Springs? Is that what uh, well, you're thinking probably Willow Springs. Willow Springs. It, it, it's I mean, we bought Willow so Springs when done. it was at capacity and we hauled. Yeah. I don't know what the numbers are, but that was pretty... That went it on was for a couple yes. of years, um, right? As another example, I know that Sheridan, the development, um, Coast Harbors Ferry, they did that for an extended period of time. I think, you know, what we would be looking at is a period of five months um, where they would have, and that's, again, one option that they would have. Yeah, that, Whether they had a larger that's not tank our and could reduce those uh, is, is a temporary <laughs> measure that I, you know, is, is not ideal, but, you know, we've, extended this discussion for <laughs> many months and, and um, you know, we could have minimized that to the extent possible and assist where possible. Not out of the ordinary, though. 
Well, can we go back then to the question I put on my list of questions that I asked then, which is free is not free. It's, we're saying it's a risk-free um, uh, money from the state. But of course, the price for that freedom is that the state has state or the, the West Virginia what, Infrastructure and Jobs Development Agency. Intention, their intentions are to put an industrial thousand acres of industry in this county. That's, nothing is free. And the $10 million that we, the $10.5 million from the state would be conditional. They would expect other industries to hook into the system because that's what they're paying for, correct? Now, industries could be light industries. They could be medium industries. But all I'm going at is that I keep hearing this free, 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 free. They're not doing this for free. They want industrial capacity moved into this county. And I fully understand where they're coming from. Fully do. This is the only county that maybe other than Morgan is not fully polluted. And, you know, it's flat. But Basically, we keep using the word free, and I do want to understand that's one of the conditions of getting this $10.5 million. I don't want to address any specific uses. I do think that the, the West Virginia Infrastructure and Jobs Development Council, their mission is to attract businesses and growth, residential, whatever it may be. Um, you know, and so that the opportunity for us to have <coughs> a sewer project that allows for future development, future growth that has been anticipated um, and addresses additional capacity issues, that's, the, I think that's all we can speak to. Um, I can't talk <coughs> about the uses or I truly, I think that's city of Ransom and Jefferson County. Well, but the JCDA basically imploded in November. I mean, effectively, this council is the one that's making development decisions for this county. Well, I think that the city of Ransom and Jefferson County make the planning and zoning decisions, which is why I had responded in that fashion that, you know, those decisions are not made by the development authority. They're made by the planning and zoning engineering departments in the city of Ransom and Jefferson County. And, and Ransom took their comprehensive plan and they took their zoning and then they took their smart code and they changed in the middle of a meeting, they effectively changed their zoning from residential, commercial at the orchard they changed it to heavy industry. I mean, they just did it. So they have the capability and we're and effectively, I mean, I'm just laying out what exists. We're sewering, uh, we're sewer readying every subdivision in Ransom. This is what the 10.5 million goes to. We're sewer readying every subdivision in Ransom. Now, if an industry decides to move in, Ransom may, that, that division, subdivision, like Tackley Mills, or is it Tackley? Uh, they may originally be res zoned for residential, but Ransom, using its smart code, can then change their, the zoning of that, and, a, and a, effectively another heavy industry could move in. I mean, and agreed. I think that's, that's why we said, you know, that, that <laughs> those are the entities that need to be where discussions need to happen about the future growth in those areas. But it's certainly more than Ransom subdivisions. We've got all of these Burr Industrial Park, Bardain, Jefferson High School, the corridor out along Shenandoah Junction. So, you know, this project addresses those. Right, but that also leaves those, those, those partials are also liable because the JCDA imploded because it authorized a heavy industrial plant in an area 
where, I mean, if you, if you, because I have them at home, I wish I had brought them. If you, if you stack the strategic plans of the five municipalities in the county together, it's, it's actually about that thick. None of them have heavy industry in it, except there's one small portion of Ranson that is zoned for heavy industry, and I think that's where the, the uh, old brass foundry, the power tan plant was. But effectively, if you go through those things, there is no heavy industry zoned in this county by either municipality or by the county. What we're effectively doing, and I think we need to understand that, is that this will sewer ready every subdivision because every one of those subdivisions is, is in the city of Ranson, except for one or two of them. But except we will be sewering up all of those subdivisions and Ranson and the county then have the capability of changing that zoning and bringing in heavy industry. Look, the utility board, and we, we realize the tough issues you're wrestling with. We're the utility board, and so we, you know, I, I think, you know, our, our focus is a little bit more limited, uh, but, but your, your points are well taken. Uh, uh, the only thing I would caution about is that if we end up going the 5.5 route and Roxel builds and whatever, whatever type of a, of a, uh, combination of line we build out there. Maybe they would come to the table, Bob, as you suggested, with a larger line. Well, if that happens, the very issue you're concerned about is, you know, you, you haven't solved that. All I'm saying is going under 5.5, starting off with just rocks or something bigger, if, if, if future development out in that area continues with an, one more 5.5 on top of another one on top of another one, if you're not careful, you end up with the, roughly the same type of, you know, makeup of, of whatever's out there, but it's going to end up costing the utility system a lot more money, and of course that means the utility customers pay a lot more money. Uh, uh, we're, we focus on building the things, the L&M expenses, are big time deals. And when you end up, you know, one of the reasons, one of the problems the district has is over the years, they built a system somewhat, of, somewhat because of topography, they had what, 30 pump stations. Mm -hmm. For a system their size with 20 some hundred customers, that's crazy. That's, you know, that's, that's one pump station for every 60 or 70 customers. Nobody would start off to do something like and that was one of the problems that, that, that hounded them in their rates because that, you know, it's just, it's just a big dollar amount to take care of all that stuff. So all I'm saying is we understand the issues you're dealing with are broader than the issues the utility board deals with. We're bringing you the options. But you got it. It, it, I don't think I don't think the s solutions are quite as simple. They're a lot more nuanced. But I, you know, I understand. <laughs> we understand where you're coming from. Well, and I, I, I'd just like to say to you. I mean, we we can't prevent that anyway. This line doesn't enable or prevent that from happening. It doesn't. It can still happen. True. So I'm um, I'm not sure. I mean, we're not preventing anything by going with 5.5 or building a smaller line. It doesn't prevent any of what you said from happening because it's out of our jurisdiction entirely. Our jurisdiction here is about building a sewer line I, and how we're gonna finance it. And, and I would agree except for the fact that, that we have a representative to the JCDA and you know, Burr is, is 400 acres. It has nothing to do with that either. But I the mean, JC they don't make any final decisions about. But they were the facilitator for this absolutely development of bringing in, you know, this county is, was being, is being prepared to be sewered up, to be watered up, and to be gassed up. And it's all emanating 
uh, to and, one and location I out there. That that should be the state's long-term goal here. I agree with you, but I have a lot of faith in our citizens and in the fact that what's been happening here uh, locally for the past seven to eight months um, would make somebody like that as an end user think twice about looking at Jefferson County. Right. And I think you're going to see that long-term outcome. Now, that's not saying this doesn't go away in five, ten years from now, something happens. Sure, that could happen. But whether we build this line or we don't, or we take the state funding, financing or we don't, we don't prevent or enable that. I, I disagree. I mean, I, I think we have to remember that, once again, <clears throat> the IJDC is the developer here. And so the developer intends to construct a 1,000-acre industrial park, and that's the purpose, the, the, the main objective for this sewer line is to service that 1,000-acre industrial park. And then, if this was any other developer, if this was DuPont that wanted to come in and build a 1,000-acre industrial park, and we weren't talking about state financing, we would be talking about the 5-5 rule and DuPont paying us. In this circumstance, we somehow act like the state is doing us a favor in this by, by loaning us this money. But in reality, they're the developer. In any other circumstance, the developer would be paying us to build a line. In this, this we're acting as if the state's doing us a favor by loaning us money that we have to repay for a project that they want to build. I don't feel at all <laughs> But that then, way, I mean, I don't feel like the state's doing us a favor well, at all. You, honestly, I don't feel like Ann, the state's done us a favor. I but, don't but feel honestly, like the then, then, the then that's, done us but, a but that's why it's important to read the application to the Infrastructure and Jobs Development Council that clearly shows that now it's apparently that application's been transferred to us. We are now the applicant. JCDA is the sponsor, and the IJDC is the developer. That's what's taking place here. So how do we prevent big industry coming to Jefferson County. How, what, what's your plan? I, Explain I'm, that to I'm, me. I, Nick, I don't have a master plan, nor do I know if that's the, the right move to prevent big industry. Um, what I'm simply saying is that this application is for a specific purpose that I think it might be wise, considering that the repayment structure here is, is based around what users are going to be using it, to go back to the IJDC and say, hey, your plan kind of got blown up on the local level. You're not probably going to get a thousand acre industrial park. Is this still something we want to spend ten and a half million dollars on? And then commit ourselves to the operation and maintenance for the next 40 years. Is that probably 40, 50, 60 years, the lifeline of, of this line? And we, have any, and, and we can't even uh, meet the capacity needs of half right now of what the build out of this thing is. I mean, it, it, it just doesn't make sense for me to do that. I, 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 we haven't even seen the financing agreement for this thing. Haven't even seen the financing agreement for it that promises all these grandiose things. And I can point to you a dozen different issues in the application where the IJDC basically threw out their own rules but they can't throw out state law. And the, one of the reasons why I'm interested in seeing the financing agreement is that state law very explicitly, now the dozen things that I can point you to, those are IJDC rules, they're not state law. They, they break their own rules, I guess they can do that. Um, but they can't break state law. And state law says that grants for these projects have to be met, ha the max is a 50-50 match. So how this can just turn into a grant if it's not repaid is beyond me because the state law says it's not allowed. I think you're referring to the a sewer line on a water line, not a, economic development. No, it's definitely economic development. Uh, okay, so just just back to <coughs> Councilmember Tolbert's concern with whether or not, I mean, be, with attracting industry to Jefferson County. Councilmember Panessa said that it, that's beyond our control. You disagreed, and I just want to understand why. That, that's where that's where I'm concerned. I don't. We we the, the, the whether it's 5.5 or the financing. Industry to that part of Jefferson County, is beyond our control. No matter which which way we go, you disagreed, and I just don't understand why. No, I disagree that this project is not under our control. It, it, this is being kind of fed to us as if we have no choice here whatsoever. Well, we absolutely do have a choice whether or not we want to service this customer, whether we want to service that area. Absolutely. That's why we've been debating it. 
there was no choice, this would have been passed quite a long time ago. I mean, we have a choice here. To service the customer? Yeah, I think so. So we can deny service to the customer? I think, and I think, Hoy, what would you say? No, if, I don't think you ho can. Hold on, hold on. The qu my question would be, if we were, if this was a traditional customer with no state financing involved in it, and they wanted to build this, this long line like this, with this, would the PSC approve that project if, at this cost? If you had a, the identical project and that you didn't have the state financing, I think I said last fall, and I would, would say again, no. You would, you, in other words, there would have to be some other subsidy put forward by the developer. But in this case, Mike, we don't, I mean, we have to deal with the facts as we have them, and this other financing package is there. So I don't, and that's what I say, if, 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 if the other financing package is turned down, and lots of reasons why you might want to do that, if you do that, then I don't think you can use the language that's in the Rule 5.5 that says if you have unusual, uh, you don't, technical issues are not an issue here, but you don't have an unusual economic or financial issue that would, that would uh, put the district at risk. But I, I get the sense through all of our meetings and conversations you're a very good utilities lawyer, and I have full confidence that you could make a very strong argument to the PSC that we are in a unique uh, financial situation here where CTUB can't even get this loan from the state government, this free money. CTUB can't even get it on their own. They have to go through not only Charlestown, but through our building commission to do it. That seems like a pretty unique financing issue that, that has to be stumbled around. And what if the building commission says no? What if we say yes and the building commission says no? It, I, I think you could easily make that argument. Now, I think if we wanted look, to argue. I can make the argument. I, you know, one of the things a lawyer is supposed to do is try to tell your client what the likely outcome of something is. And I'm just telling you under the facts as, that I, know, as I know them now, the likely outcome is we could not use that. That doesn't say we, you couldn't try to use it. doesn't say you, you, you might not prevail if you did use it. But I, I, think, the, I think the odds of it are pretty low. Hoy, def define what you just said. What do you mean define? But what you just, your, your last sentence, what, what would we be asking the PSC to do? Well, I, th I think, you know, uh, golly, I hate discussing legal tactics in an open I, session. I know, but I'd rather not do that. The complaint in this case, if you refuse service, is going to be Roxy. They're the ones that are going to take you down to the Public Service Commission. You're going to be the defendant in the case. But if 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 Roxel has put in an applicate or put in a request for us to cost out the cost of of a sewer line, if we provide them with that information, we provide them with that thing, and then we say effectively, Roxel, give us the nine million or the ten million dollars to build this thing. Roxel can't come after us, and if they give us the money, then we are obligated to build it. That is the, the bottom line. You can, we're not, we're, we're not, we don't have to, we, we have to build it, but we don't have to pay for it. We're obligated to provide service. I think that's the bottom line. I would, it's my take on the whole Roxel paying for it thing, is they'll just get the loan from the state instead of us. I mean, they'll pay interest uh, over us, but yeah. that's a pretty big boy. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, and I, 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 I see what you're saying, and I, and I agree. I think, a lot of it. yeah, I agree that if you look at it, you would say, hey, we're we're uh, we're facilitating the industrialization of Jefferson County or the potential industrialization of Jefferson County. And you're right, people can change zoning laws and all that kind of stuff, but I really don't think we're going to be caught asleep at the wheel this time, or the citizens of Jefferson County aren't going to let. Our role is sewer in this particular case. It's not development and, and uh, grants, and it's not development and uh, the rest of the county. If it were, I think I'd, I, I would kind of have a different tact here. But as somebody pointed out to me, and I had to think about it, you can't use sewer service to control development. That's, that's not our role. 
But in essence, that's kind of what we're doing because we're building in all this excess capacity for developments that don't exist, that haven't requested service. I mean, why aren't we taking this project south of here down to the Virginia line? But let's, but say if we, let's say we go to a different option then, right? We say, well, let's not have the capacity and all that kind of stuff. It's still going to be there. We're still, if you will, facilitating development and industrialization, if you will. It's just going to be more arduous and it's going to be on the backs of the current rate payers that, that are paying the sewer and water, uh, mainly sewer for. And I understand that argument. My, my concern is if we build this large system with no users, with no event, not no users, but not nearly the amount of users that are anticipated in these studies. So what's the downside to that? That's a good point. So Operational maintenance costs after um, the loan is serviced, really. What's the downside? Let's say only. Well, I, right, I think I, two points. Um, you know, why are we building this line the size that it is um, to the Rockwell site? The developments, the growth projections have been on the books for a number of years and they change consistently, granted. Um, you know, but the reason that we're building this line and taking advantage of this opportunity is to address those capacity issues. You can look at the Jefferson County PSD sewer strategic plan that identifies um, very, very limited capacity in that region. That, that That's nothing new. Um, it, it's not as if we just picked properties in that along this corridor um, that haven't been identified as growth potentials. With regard to the O&M expenses, the way that this project is designed is that each pump station has multiple force mains coming <coughs> out of the system. Um, so, you know, they range from a four to a six to an eight for the orchard pump station and a six and two eighths from the war admiral pump station. So it's the model that we used at Huntfield. Um, Huntfield was designed for 3000 units. What's built out there is maybe 350 to 375. I'm taking the under, but it, yeah. It, there's, taking the under. <laughs> there's no impact or no downside to having that infrastructure in the ground, utilizing a very small force main. And then when we get to the point where we've got the capacity and the flows that increase and we need to change to the next force main, you know, it's there. We don't have to have another project or a potential rate increase. Um, at Huntfield, we're using still the smallest line that's out there, which there are three in the ground and one future potential. So there's no, there's not a downside. If, if Rockwell then gave us nine million, ten million dollars, would we put in three lines? Same. Would we put in a, a large line, a small line, just like Huntfield? Would we would we do the same? Yeah, I mean that's we would do the project. Uh, that's so that's we're, the but process of the vetting that you know we went through. We have the project that we think that, that needs to be built. But that's where I wanted to go with this whole thing. We're not just simply putting in one simple little single pipe. We're putting in multiple pipes running from one pump station to another, depending on the capacity, then using one or two pipes. Um, but we're, we're not limiting the capacity down to just the size of what Rockwell needs for phase one and phase two. Right, Regardless right. of whether they give us they give us ten million dollars, we're still gonna build it out. Or well this pro yes, the project as designed and approved allows flexibility to address low flows um, through the progression to the ultimate build out at whatever year that is. But, but we've got the flexibility in the project to do that uh, in a single construction project yeah. I'm not sure if you're all talking about the same I mean, I am not. the same thing she's I think you're talking about the, the bigger I'm project trying to stay focused on the project as yeah I think you're yes. talking about a Roxel only thing or something akin to Roxel only. Then, then 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 what's the, the answer the, the Rockwell only design is likely a single it, it hasn't been designed yet it hasn't been costed out yet i don't know whether it would be to only serve their site well, we, well that's okay. what they're asking yeah uh, right right 
and, and that's what I want to know. I mean, we, frankly, we spent, we're going to have to pay for a million dollars worth of planning work that was done by RANTS, and part of it is the Hatch-Chester plan. I don't know why we're going back and having to do as much because we've already, a lot of that's already been done, but that's what I wanted to address. Significantly different project. The Rockwell request is only for the 46,800 gallons per day. Project that has been designed and approved, which was what the million dollars was spent on, um, is a million gallons per day. So they're significantly different projects. So it was approved by DSD then? It was approved no. by the State Health Department and all of the other agencies. So we have DOH approvals, railroad permits. So you'd have to do the same thing with the Rockville then? Yes, we would have to update all when of you them. say approved, that's what you're talking about. Yeah, yes. you've got to go back through the permitting to process, that's, that's even that's though you're reducing the scope of the project. Like the same early, but not the DEP. That wouldn't have to start over again. That would not have to start. No. no. That would not have to repeat. <clears throat> but I, I do think, though, this, this has been a really good discussion. Um, and it does demonstrate that there are going to be times when the interest of the council differs from the interest of the utility board. And I, for one, believe that the, the Jefferson County Development Authority, which should be the gatekeeper, in this case, it turned out that it was the facilitator. And if you, you really do, I'll bring it in next week. I got all, I printed out all of the five municipalities and the, the counties comprehensive plans and they come up to that thick and we find ourselves in the midst of absolutely no one in this county approving heavy industry we now find ourselves to the point where heavy industry may move within that four mile corridor uh, where everyone basically said it, it should not be because Ransom can change its zoning on a heartbeat and the JCDA was the facilitator. Now, hopefully, the JCDA will get reconstituted and will people will read their comprehensive plans. But we have a representative on the JCDA, and we've said clearly that heavy industry is not something that Charlestown wants. And the other municipalities in the county have said the same thing. So I, I do think this is a good, I think that we do because the because we have, because we are represented on the JCDA, because the JCDA is the gatekeeper and the JCDA has effectively imploded, we are effectively one of the gatekeepers now for industry in the county, at least until the JCDA comes back. Disagree, I, I fully understand where you're coming from, but Right now, there, are, there is no gatekeeper for heavy industry in Jefferson County. But even if there was, it's here. That particular customer I, is already here. I do, yeah. And, I, and I, I know where you're coming from, Bob, and I agree with you. It's, it's here and it may not be stoppable, but where I'm coming, where I'm coming from is that first year on council, if you remember correctly, JCDA came in here and said, Council, there's an opportunity for um, gas to come to Charlestown. And we were all excited for it. And we passed actually on the 4th of April, 14th of April of 2016. We passed an ordinance or passed a resolution saying that we were happy that gas would be coming, a pipeline of gas would be coming to Charlestown. Well, what happened? That pipeline originally, theoretically, was coming to Charlestown, but Mountain Gas then altered it. They altered imperceptibly the, slightly the, the direction of that gas line, and now it's going toward that county site. So what we, and then if you read Mountaineer's Gas's argument, they say, well, the different governments within Jefferson County requested or said that gas service would be good. So we were kind of used as a pawn to help bring gas into this county. 
which we thought was going to go for residential use in Charlestown, an endpoint actually in Charlestown, but it actually turned out to be, uh, it's going to endpoint basically at, at the, uh, the, uh, the orchard bills or the orchard site. So I, I am kind of concerned when, when Ranson can turn around in the middle of a day and change their zoning, and when there was no zone, there was no heavy industry plan for this area, and the fact that we do have a representative on JCDA and the county, we 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 are a part of the county. We're not just Charlestown. We are a part of the county. And I know for the I know for the utility, you have your interest, but. I think for us and some of us on the council, we also have to look, feel that we have to look out for the broader interest of the county. So, so real quick, and I, I, I apologize, I'm gonna ask you some questions because I just, I just don't understand. So you said that JCDA is the gatekeeper. Okay, so if, well, what was the company you used as an example? Was it like DuPont or something? So if DuPont wants to move in over to that other, other portion of the orchard site, does the JCDA have any authority to prevent that? In my head, that answer is no. We have no, they have no jurisdiction over it. We have no jurisdiction over it. That's, that, that arrangement would only be between, <coughs> essentially, I guess that would be the decision with the city of Ranson because of the zoning changes, the overnight zoning changes that you, cha that you referenced before. And actually, even after that, I don't think even Ranson could say no at this point. You know, because they, they already opened open that door, so they can't really close it. So I guess I'm confused. What what is the what is the gatekeeper aspect of it? I'm I'm confused. First, <clears throat> I I and I don't know all of the rules of the Jefferson County Development Authority, but in my mind, the burr is is 400 acres. It's it's a square with 400 acres, right, Ian? And, and, and I don't want to cut you off, but 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 Burr isn't in the city of Ranson, correct? It's in the county. Yeah. That's in the county. So let's just stick let's just stick with the city of Ranson right now, okay. in, in that example. In, in the comprehensive plans of the six for the five municipalities in the county basically say that except for literally one kind of small area in the middle of Ranson out there where the brass factory used to be. Those are the only places in Jefferson County where you can have this type of heavier industry. Okay. Okay. To me, the Jefferson County Development Authority, in this case, was a facilitator. And if someone uh, agreed, so and what if so heavier industry comes in, then the Development Authority can. They can't, as you said, they don't have the authority to turn it down. Okay. But they don't have, they don't have to assist it. I think they do. I mean, I think to the extent that if the phone rings and there is a prospect that wants to come and look at acreage in the industrial park, I think they have to do that. The only thing they really do have the ability to do is sell lots within the industrial park because they are the owner there um, and sometimes negotiate on utilities. We, we did that before when I... I served on the development authority for three years, so I'm just trying to be helpful to the discussion. But, but they don't have any, I mean, that's why the pilot agreement had to be, had to be approved by the county commission and that they don't have any taxing authority. They don't have any um, of that kind of authority. They could have held the, the bonds, as is being suggested here, for the water side of it. Um, obviously, Rockwell didn't want to sit around and wait for the county commission to put the JCDA back in place to build its water line, so it went ahead and made its own arrangement there. Um, so it, it doesn't, I, but I certainly never saw myself as a gatekeeper when I was on the JCDA, um, simply because economic development didn't work like that and they didn't function like that. I, I shouldn't say economic development doesn't work like that. I should say they did not function that way. A lot of their leads came through this, the state development office. 
Uh, very often the state would bring a prospect to us locally to get involved after they'd worked with the state for quite a number of times. Um, I don't think the development authority ever saw itself in a position to say, pick and choose. We did not operate that way, and it's part of the reason I'm not there anymore, because they certainly didn't do that. Whatever lead was brought their way, they ran to ground all the way to the end or until the customer end user walked away. And, and I think with and with moving forward, I hope that this organization will operate differently. differently. Right. Uh, that's the hope, but that process is is taking quite some time. So, um, but but so that but is still, the hope. And in this case, you know, the only reason this facility didn't go into the industrial park is because the county doesn't have the zoning to support the stack and other portions of it. That's why it deliberately went into ransom. That's, that's why that property became attractive to this end user. And the development authority certainly pulled Ransom in as a partner in that process, um, as, well as, as well as the state. I don't know where they initiated, I, I have no idea. I have no idea if their site selector went to the state first or went to the, the local development authority, but that's, that's how the organization, in my opinion, in my experience there, function and uh, so I, I don't know about the gatekeeper role but we are way off topic where where exactly where are we going with this I we feel like we, we have a whole other issue to take up so next question no I mean I guess that was it so so essentially the door is open and no one else can close it that's how I understand this debate unless I'm wrong please please correct me I, I think when you have a 21 member organization of appointed representatives from all over the county and all the municipalities I I hope once this is this organization comes back up to speed. Yes, it it did function by running to ground every single opportunity that came to the door. But when you have 21 people that are somewhat motivated and say that we will not have one of these things again, that makes an impact on the staff that you hire and what the staff do and how how hard they run to ground some of these things. Um, and then give some opportunity for the other municipalities and other folks in the thing to exert some influence upon the city of Ransom, which to basically, because they can say no to this. Um, I'm, I'm hoping things will change, but I think right now we have a little bit more we do have some influence over development in the county and we I just think yeah we do have some influence over development in the county um, and what and I don't disagree with that and, and I don't disagree with that but my point is what uh, my point earlier was whether we build this line or we don't build this line or we finance it or we finance it 5.5 doesn't change either way. What, we, we haven't exerted an influence that makes a change either way. Meaning? They, they don't get a building permit without securing utilities. Well, they're going to get utilities. It's just a matter of which options we choose. I understand, but I'm, I'm just saying there is an option that we say that's an infeasible path to build that sewer line, and I'm, I'm just saying it is an option. Now, whether you want to commit to that option, that's totally everybody's personal okay. choice. Well, then we're getting into debate, which is what we should do on the fourth. So why don't we? All right, yeah, let's say there, there is another option, and that is what stops I, them from getting a building. Certainly, we can we can talk about that at the other time. Is, are, have we exhausted construct uh, discussion on 3227? Is there anything? anyone would like to bring up. If not, I'd like to move on to uh, 3228 parity bonds. <clears throat> All right, so uh, Councilman Trainer had asked if we could do just a, a little bit of a, a recap on what parity bonds mean and how it's involved in this particular project. Um, John Stump, who is the expert on this, uh, could be here this evening. He will be here on Monday, so um, I, I hopefully view this as maybe a way to Again, sort of introduce parity bonds and how I understand them to work, um, and then there are specific questions. We can certainly make sure that we have John address those on on Monday. So, on a high level, um, you know, I put the definition of parity bonds in there. It's two or more issues 
or series of bonds. And if you think about the way that we issue bonds, we issue them in series. So uh, it, series 2019A, 2019B, what have you. So, so you know, series of bonds, these aren't always issued at exactly the same time. They're issued periodically. So basically, two or more issues are series of bonds that have the same priority claim on the pledged revenues. So essentially, in the water and sewer industry, the pledged revenues are the water and sewer payments. So essentially, what you're saying is, is you as a bondholder, you as an investor, have a, a first right to those revenues in order to be paid back your money. And even if you bought a bond today, and we issue a bond, a, di a different series at a later point, you're, you're eligible for current and future revenues of the combined system. So the bondholder in issue A and the bondholder in issue B essentially have the same rights to those revenues. Um, and they also have the same rights to the security. And in this case, the, the collateral here is, uh, you know, it's the assets of the, of the sewer line. It's the pump station, it's the line, it's the what have you, that type of thing. So everybody's got the same claim to it if you issue under a standard revenue bond model. Um, so, for example, I mean, I think about what's, what's the last big bond issue we did. We did a, uh, for the water plant upgrade. Um, so essentially, I mean, think about the bondholder that made that investment there. That bondholder thinks that, uh, you know, it understood what the revenue streams of the system were at the time they bought the bonds, so they understood what their risk was going to be. The fact that you would then layer on an additional bond that maybe doesn't have the same strength of revenues means that the initial bondholder now assumes a little more risk that they didn't maybe anticipate at the time that they bought the bond. So, and this works fine. This works fine as long as the next set of bonds and the next set of revenues can support the next set of debt or the next issue of debt. Um, where, it, where it becomes problematic is if at some point the equation gets out of balance. Like what could happen here, again, if, you, if we issued this bond as a standard revenue bond and it was part of the combined system, you'd have, again, old or existing bondholders who are now on equal status with new bondholders who basically jumped in on a, on a project that doesn't have the revenue stream to basically support it. And if the equation gets way out of whack, you're basically non-compliant. And if you're non-compliant, basically you have to do something to come back into compliance. And the way you do that is through a rate increase. Basically, you've got to generate more revenues. So this is, I think, to the point that John Kunkel has raised multiple times. I mean, he's talked to us about what the debt coverage ratios are in order to operate the system, and the bondholders have an expectation that you're going to maintain those, uh, those debt coverage ratios. So when, when, you, when you issue surety bonds uh, uh, before the issuance, uh, it, it, uh, certification is required as far as uh, bond coverage and things of that nature to make sure that it, all the bondholders are on an equal footing? Yeah. So, before we get into the specifics of our particular project, I mean, the scenario in which you now have this, this parity of all the bondholders, I mean, the, 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 the potential here is that it could raise the interest rates on future issues because the next bondholders in see more risk in the system than they did before because the revenues may not be quite as strong, although they're still compliant. They might not be quite as strong, so it may raise the borrowing costs of the city in future scenarios. Again, I'm not saying that it would. I'm just saying that it could happen that way. All right, so, um, so if the city accepted the state financing and issued debt like a standard revenue bond as part of the combined water works and sewer system, all revenues would be on par with all the previous bondholders. And again, the, the collateral would be owned essentially by all the bondholders. Issuing it through the bond or through the building commission rather than the city shields the revenues and the assets from being combined with the others. And I think that's, that's a point that, that John Kunkel has raised multiple times. In some ways, it's, it's kind of the point you were making here, that, that Ranton had figured out a way to basically shield it through an alternate mainline agreement. And I'm not saying that we couldn't get to the same point, but I'm just saying that, that the reason to engage the building commission is so that you can shield the revenues and assets from being a part of the combined system. You'd have a separate issuer. In this case, you'd have the building commission as opposed to the city of Charlestown. The city of Charlestown is basically the issuer of all the other um, utility debt. And if you think about the way that the building commission issues debt, it basically the structure is different. 
It's basically built on um, the asset that they're financing. Let's take the municipal building, for example, down there uh, where the police and utility uh, headquarters are now. I mean, it's basically issued on you know, the, the, the value of the building itself, how much money is going to be borrowed, and then ultimately the lease agreement, how much we're going to pay back. So the bondholder feels pretty confident that they're going to be paid back under that structure. But that's a, that's a standalone um, transaction. So the next time the building commission goes out and does something else, the bondholders who bought the bonds related to 661 are not necessarily impacted by the next issue or the next issue or the next issue. So, um, so it could shield the revenues. This may matter less to the new bondholder. In this particular case, it's the Water Development Authority. So uh, this is my, my speculation on this. So maybe the Water Development Authority cares about the revenues being separated, or maybe they don't. But I think at the end of the day, basically they're entering into this agreement with a full understanding of what the revenue stream looks like. So they already know the risk. So like I'm saying, the fact that, that maybe the, the, the net revenues are not as strong as a traditional bondholder might like, the WDA is okay with that because they've basically executed this agreement. What they may care more about is the fact that it's a line of sufficient capacity to basically encourage future economic development. And they, what they may not want to do is give up the, um, uh, what am I going to call it, security. They may not want to give up control of the line to other bondholders because if there was something that happened in the future and they were to take a an equal position, they basically have no more authority over the line and what happens to it than any other bondholder that comes along. Again, I'm not saying that's where the WDA is, but it's something, it's an important thing to note. And the reason why I think it's important is because one alternative that we've talked to um, John Stump a little bit about, and, I, and the WDA has not agreed to this, but one option was thought, well, what, if you didn't do it through the building commission and you did it through a traditional city uh, lease agreement, would they take a junior position so that the other bondholders basically are secured? But again, if they take a junior position, they give up some control of the line and they may not want to do that. They want to have probably whatever control they could exercise on that line going forward. Um, uh, and again, I'm not saying that they would. The other thing is that legal counsel has also said that they believe that the structure protects the city's long-term or protects the city in the long term because it prevents future state administrations from changing the deal in some way, shape, or form moving forward. Now, remember, we will have a lease agreement. We will have a loan agreement. It basically will spell out the terms. It would be difficult for a future state administration to undo the deal, but, I, you know, lawyers, right? Uh, uh, belts and suspenders, right? Put both of them in there, right? So basically what they want to do is make sure that some future administration couldn't come back and basically say at the end of 25 years, you didn't pay us all of it back. You know, we said we'd forgive it. We really don't want to forgive it. You've got to figure out a way to finance it. And if it were part of a combined system, they would probably say, well, you've got lots of other resources. Just go talk to your tax pay rate payers. They'll help pay for it. And again, I think we're just basically trying to avoid that outcome altogether. The final thing I will say is, so then it, as I look back at the flow of funds, um, the, the, um, the image that's in the packet, the last page, the last two points are really the bonds under this scenario, the bonds are secured solely by the rental payments under the lease and the uh, credit line deed of trust on the project, so basically the building or the facility itself, which rental payments um, under the lease are limited solely to the net revenues generated from the project. So again, he basically is reinforcing the notion that that's what this structure does and it prevents it from being part of the combined system. So. Like I said, there, there may be ways to, to finance this in a way that doesn't, um, well, th there may be ways to do this in a way that would not necessarily impact the existing bondholders. Like I said, maybe it's a junior lien position, maybe, but we'd have to go back to the lender and they'd have to agree to it. Maybe it's through an alternate mainline agreement where they agree to take a junior position or some other scenario. But those, nobody has had any conversation with the lender uh, or Rockwell about those particular outcomes. So, I'll stop there. Boy. Yes, sir. You represent um, what? 
Berkeley County. Yes. Berkeley County water. Water. Okay. Y'all just built P and G, and you have all those other facilities out there. Have they gone to the Infrastructure and Jobs Development Agency, and do they do they do y'all run yours through your building? Well, I also represent. Uh, I did represent the Development Authority here until about three or four years ago, I, and so I've represented them for about twenty years or so, and I represent my home county of Hampshire. Development Authority, and I was on the Berkeley County Development Authority for six or nine years. I'm not sure how long. Uh, in response to your question uh, specifically about P&G, the answer is yes. Uh, Berkeley County's uh, in the process of building about $15 million worth of improvements to its water system, comprised of about 13 projects. Some of them are a quarter of a million dollars. The largest one was the new water tank. If you all remember, if any of you are familiar with the north end of the airport where Grubbs Corner is located, there's a new two million gallon water tank up there. And, and the financing there was nowhere near as favorable as what you have, but it's, it was different than what the, the, the water district could get by going into the bond market. They basically said, we'll loan you the money and you don't have, and it will not accrue interest, and you do not have to pay it back until P and G gets up and running. And by up and running, I'm meaning, you know, they're phasing that in. If you all read the newspapers, they're they're not anywhere close to uh, running that thing at full full bore. But then that loan has to be paid back over. I don't know. I'm not sure the number of years, and it, it does bear an interest. Rate, rate on, but it was a it was a better deal than they could get going into the market. Uh, uh, the development authority does all types of uh, uh, other loans. Uh, they they did a loan several years ago for Hampshire County for their little, they have a little uh, uh, business park just east of the village of Cape and Bridge, the town of Cape and Bridge, right off of Route 50. And it has its own standalone water and sewer system that belonged to the development authority and were financed, the construction of it was financed through a loan from the West Virginia Economic Development Group that flowed through the IJDC, just like this one did. So yes, they do those types of projects uh, you know, around the state. Right, uh, again, I think the last time we had a work session, when Governor Wise was governor, they, we passed a... Uh, $400 million bond issue. 300 of it was dedicated to uh, uh, water and sewer, straight water and sewer, and the other 100 is comes through the State Economic Development Authority, and it's used for a variety of things. Uh, this loan that we're talking about tonight and a lot of these other projects I just talked about, so that's where the source of the money comes from. But the IJDC and the Water Development Authority manage them. They manage all of these different loan programs. But is it is it your history that um, whether Berkeley Water goes through some kind of the county's development authority? No, or the no. Building, building. How how unique is it that well, we would be number one? The Berkeley, the Berkeley Water is the largest public service district in the state uh, for water, and I think it's the fourth or fifth largest water system in the state. West Virginia American dwarfs everybody. So it has a fin the financial ability to, it does almost all of its borrowing now by going to Wall Street. It has its own independent underlying rating, and they may just go fund their projects. They, they can structure the deals a lot more repayment, flexible repayment schedules, and, and they're able to to borrow a good bit of money and keep rates at a reasonable, reasonably low level. Uh, but uh, uh, I'm not aware that the State Development Authority has been involved in any of their other projects other than the one I just described to you. But even if they go to the private market, it's basically based upon an understanding that they've got revenues coming in yes. that'll pay the bondholders right. back. 
Right. So and, it, and, yeah, it, and it, they're, they're all parity bonds. Now, they have issued in the past, I don't want to get too deep in the week, they've issued bonds that were secondary. They were not parity bonds, but they were for specific purposes and they've been paid off. And those, those, so those people were, they, they got, their only lien was on the leftovers. And, uh, but they, they mainly issue traditional revenue bonds. So again, John, John will be here on uh, Monday night to help answer questions yeah. about the, the uh, building commission structure, but hopefully that's at least a good enough introduction. All right. Anything further? Without objection, I'd like to adjourn. We're adjourned.